Who was I? A millionaire wanderer and wayfarer, a brutal and violent man driven into the world, a man who fled his own country, settled by his forefathers, a fellow whose heart said, I want, I want, I want, who played the violin in despair, seeking the voice of angels, who had to burst the spirit's sleep or else. So what could I tell this old queen in a lion's skin and raincoat, for she had buttoned herself up in it? That I had ruined the original piece of goods issued to me and was traveling to find a remedy? Or that I had read somewhere that the forgiveness of sin was perpetual, but with typical carelessness had lost the book? I said to myself, You must answer the woman, Henderson. She is waiting. But how? And the process started over again. Once more it was, Who are you? And I had to confess that I didn't know where to begin. Hey, this is David. Hey, it's Nick. Hey, it's Eric. On this episode of the Boss Podcast, we are discussing Saul Bellow's novel Henderson the Rain King, which continues some of the themes of death and dying we worked through in the previous episode. In this novel, though, we're presented with Eugene Henderson, whose fear and confrontation with death causes him to seek out the best way for him to live. Yeah, and joining us today, we have Eric Hyman, who's filling in for uh, Boss Mainstay Nathan, who unfortunately today is under the weather. Uh, but luckily, Eric is is kind of a uh, a Bellow super fan of sorts, and uh, that's going to help us when we start to dig into this because uh, Bellow, for the most part, has has made a name for himself by paying attention to the details and and really like investigating how uh, you know we operate in modern life. Um, but there's something about Henderson the Rain King where uh, the character and the way of going at it is maybe a little unlike a lot of stuff that we've expected from Bellow. So I guess, Eric, to start off, uh, how does how does this line up with expectations you've had with Bellow and, you know, things you've read in the past and having, you know, run through Henderson, you know, what do you, what do you think it really looks like when you try to fit it all together? Reading this book, I was surprised how plot driven it was. You know, the, the books that I've read by Bellow, um, Seize the Day, Herzog, uh, Mr. Sandler's Planet, Humboldt's Gift, um, those books seem to be, you know, comparatively very threadbare in terms of a plot. They were much more these internal dialogues of these flawed men and and the plot was really almost incidental and with Henderson, you know, this he weaves a much bigger sort of almost fable-like story around this character which is very different I think from the from the more realistic realism-based books that I mentioned before. And I think and that took me a little aback, I have to admit. I in, in in the beginning of the book I was not as enamored with it, I think, as um I was the other ones because of this. I just felt in some ways the story um was getting it in the way of the usual bellow um tropes that I had enjoyed in the past. And um but I think what's very interesting about the book for me, it, you know, it's situated before that kind of trilogy of really great books. I think it's Herzog, Mr. Sandler's Planet, and then Humboldt's Gift, at least for me. And so, you know, it, it's interesting. I think that uh, the last half of Henderson, especially the last three chapters, for me, seem to be this point where Bellow really freed himself from the story itself and, um, you know, went into this really intense, you know, existential study meditation on what had come before. And, and it felt very freeing in, in, the, in comparison to the rest of the book. And I feel I, what I always felt is that almost those three stories were a freeing experience for Bello to really express the intensity of what he did in the books that followed. Yeah, exactly. So you, you've definitely hit on some stuff that was funny as, as I'm reading it, the uh, kind of wanting to fight the fact that this is very much just a full-blown adventure novel at points, and uh, you know there is a plot, and you're 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 sort of rooting for for the action, and you, you're pulled into that. Uh, but for me, at least, with expectations with Bello, it's almost like I didn't want that, and it took me a little while to get into that. And uh, it's it's fascinating to me that for as much as this book relies on that. Uh, like you said, where he sort of tucked it in at the end and, and pulled it all together, that uh, it actually has one of the more like emotional and poignant conclusions uh, of of the Bella books that I have read. So it's it's both 
more playful and more comedic and more kind of boisterous uh, in and of itself, thanks to uh, Eugene Henderson. But then it also pulls back to such a such a wonderful conclusion. And uh, I don't know, I, I I totally agree that this is this is probably cathartic or, or freeing in some level for Bellow itself. Um, but I guess uh, kind of pitching it back to David, uh, let's let's talk about the character of Henderson, uh, just how uh, loudmouth and outspoken and erratic, and it's, it's sort of where that fits in, in in terms of you know the time period it was written, uh, all that fun stuff. Just a quick thought on this idea of freeing for for Bello. I haven't read a whole lot of Bello outside of the short works we t- discussed before, so I didn't really get that sense. I got, I got the freeing sense more for Eugene, for Henderson himself at the end of the novel. I wasn't as concerned about it being overly plot-driven because I, I found Henderson such a great narrator. Like, I really enjoyed his experience, and so him getting into, I guess, what you might consider conventional adventure tropes or travel narrative tropes, whatever you want to call them. I, I was never, you know, like, Oh, this feels burdened by too much plot because he's always, as as the book's premise and as it starts, he's always in search of something within himself, and so that's always a primary concern throughout those adventure stories. Um, David, something I would add to that too that I think that I I realized that finishing this book too was that the, the good thing about this more plot driven book is that it allows Bello to be a a lot funnier. Um, there's definitely humor in the books that come after this one, but the humor tends to be very acidic and, and caustic. And I found myself laughing a lot out loud here in a way that wasn't sort of one of those unsettling laughs. It was more like just pure unadulterated humor. I mean, Henderson is a funny guy. And I think that that's where this book is also very exceptional and, and different from the Bella stuff that I've read in the sense that this guy is is an endearing jerk where a lot of the where a lot of the characters I think in the future novels really skirted a lot more where they're just like jerks and uh and you have a harder time relating and sympathizing with them um and so I think you know the the plot allows Bello to really be a lot just baldly funnier, which was really exhilarating as someone who had read the other books and not felt that way. I think reading them in the past, the other ones in the past. Yeah. So here's a question: Do you guys actually, at the end of the day, like uh, Henderson as a character? Because I initially was sort of, uh, I don't want to say disgusted, but maybe a little bit annoyed with him. He's he's unreliable. He he shoots from the hip. All this stuff. Um, but I feel just very appreciative of how honest and how open and how just willing to keep pushing forward and all that stuff. And I've, I've kind of pulled a U-turn and, and uh, very much respect him uh, as an individual character, despite all of his shortcomings, uh, probably because he is so open about that. So what was your guys' impression just looking at that character directly? Yeah, so something we talked about, the idea that Bello sort of, his characters embody their inner selves, their souls. So Henderson is this large, awkward, violent sort of force of nature who who just kind of pushes through whatever situation he's in. He kind of does whatever he wants, and yet he's struggling with really knowing himself. And so when when the book opens, even though it opens after the African trip and he's kind of looking back on it, you don't really root for him. And I, you, do, you do, at least I did, like, like you, Nick, found him to be somewhat difficult to to appreciate and hard to root for. And then even when he first gets to Africa, it's still hard to root for him because he feels, and he even acknowledges, like he's going to get something, some sort of reciprocity out of helping these poor African people, the the first tribe that he comes across. And you, you get this sort of awkward racial thing, this awkward other thing. And it's not until later that you start to side with him. Once he starts getting into trouble, and maybe this is part of the whole plot thing and the reason Bello uses it is once he starts getting into trouble and there's a certain amount of fear that that goes into him is when I think he opens up a little more and as a reader you start to to feel for him, at least side with him on certain things. Yeah, David, I would agree with that. I think that for me, he's one of the more endearing characters in Bello's, in the books of Bello that I've read. And I think it is exactly that, that... Once he gets going into Africa, even though he is a lout, um, 
he's an endearing lout. You know, he me he wants to do good. He wants to do something meaningful for both. I think the tribes and the people he encounters, as well as himself, and I mean, he can't help but screw it up because that's sort of his character to a certain degree. But again, that sort of plot and that humor really endears him a lot more than some of these other characters like Herzog or Humboldt, who you know I can relate to in their flaws. But you know, there's a, there's things so abhorrent about them that you you know it makes you sort of go whoa. Whereas I, you know, especially in the latter half of the the book, I I was always just kind of charmed by you know Hen, um, Henderson sort of you know wanting to learn from the king, you know wanting to help these people out, even wanting to sort of connect with the um, the stewardess on the plane. You know, at the end, there was just <laughs> something so um, infectious about his excitement ignorant insight excitement maybe but still there was this kind of energy that you know for me it's like yeah that's the way you want to go through life and you're gonna screw up and you're gonna say the wrong thing and i i think especially in the these times now where we are i think in a very kind of fraught borderline politically correct time that's being offset by the obnoxious things that maybe trump is saying it, there's something really endearing about this guy that sort of talks first and you know thinks later yeah, and he it just continually drops the best philosophical nuggets just out of the side of his mouth without even thinking. And like you mentioned him just chatting with the stewardess at the end. And uh, I, I love that just in the presence of a very basic, like, I'm getting to know you conversation, uh, 30 seconds in, he'll he'll just drop something like the quote, instead of coming to ourselves, I said, we all grow kinds of deformities and enormities. At least something can be done for those, you know, while we wait for the day. And here this is, is just this tiny little piece of, of, of worldview uh, given to, I think, like a 22-year-old stewardess on a, on a cross-Atlantic flight. And, uh, you know, he, he just has no filter in any respect. And what that really means is that some of the stuff that comes out is equally brilliant or uh, obtuse. And it's, it's kind of, it's kind of uh, I don't know, I respect that. I, I really uh, came to love and root for uh, Henderson. And, uh, I, I guess one, one thing you guys had sort of brought up is relationship with the King and sort of the, the philosophical discourse there. I kind of wanted to talk about maybe the differing opinions and how they related to change sort of the King's, uh, philosophy of, um, wanting to truly change somebody into a different form. And in, in this case, a lion, and uh, sort of Henderson going along with that and trying and trying, and then how that's related to um, maybe the change or potentially lack of change of, char- of the character of Henderson itself. So, like, David, how did you uh, sort of get an impression of, of how those came together? Okay, so I think this is where we might have a bit of a disagreement based on our sort of pre-recording notes that we made to each other. I, I don't know if I see Dafu as wanting to change forms necessarily i I see him as wanting to dig deeper into a the most simple and pure natural form and and for dafu the king i think the lion is is the most regal and the most natural for him and in henderson he he sees that similarity and he's sort of the reason he's putting them through these these sort of ridiculous exercises of of you know crawling on the ground and and bellowing out that he's trying to get him in touch with his natural self. And, you know, the king is, is, is one that really believes what we talked about earlier, this this idea of embodied soul. Dafu actually believes that you can transform your outer manifestation based on what you actually think and feel and understand about the world and who you are. That understanding changes your actual physical shape. So his idea, I think, is more about finding the, the most extreme form of the nature within us and i think he serves as an example to henderson as and the reader as someone that goes too far towards that ideology yeah he's, he's very much the kind of in the characters in bellow novels of the you know the wisdom giver or the person that the person that is influencing and then pulling uh you know the main character in a certain direction and, and pushing them to to look deeper within themselves and uh yeah I, I mean those are all those are all excellent points um I, uh, 
Yeah, I guess I was thinking in terms of a point that you know Nathan had made previously, and yes, we will continue to reference Nathan even though he's in absence. Uh, <laughs> but you know, sort of the difference in Henderson looking to have this truly uh, formative uh, bursting of the spirit sleep moment uh, versus kind of the slow uh, pushing and, and beating and um, looking to get that change in form, as you've mentioned, connected back to potentially how the soul always meant to be. Um, but, you know, I sort of I sort of view still that as having a little bit of a clash in um, ideologies and differing viewpoints. And so, uh, I don't know, I guess, Eric, do you, what's your view on that? Well, yeah, I mean, I think, again, the plot allows Bella to sort of create this extreme foil in the king, right? You know, in, in another Bella novel, you, he would just be encountering other people on the streets of Chicago or New York City, whereas the plot really allows, you know, Bella to present this, you know, almost diametrically opposed sort of character in the sense that, you know, the king is much more he has a much more kind of Zen sort of vibe. He seems, you know, very kind of driven and there's not a lot of ambivalence I feel on in the King. The King just seems to have this very kind of settled, like this is my destiny. This is the way we've done things. This is, you know, Henderson, why don't you just chill out and kind of embrace this? And I, and I think that the nice thing about that, even if I feel like the, the character itself might be a little, cliched in the grand scope of things it provides it makes Henderson look all the more ridiculous and funny and I think that what it does for me is that it it um it creates it it makes the reader much more aware of how ridiculous um sort of in vain a lot of this kind of spiritual exploration is and yet we we still do it, and all cultures do it, just in different ways. And, and, and you know, it, it, that's what living is about. And I think ultimately that's kind of what the book is really positing, is that we, you know, part of this quest is really what makes us alive in the first place. And that this, there are very different ways to go about it. And the, I think the contrast between these two characters is, you know, right for both interesting ph- philosophical asides and, and proclamations, but also just, it, it's funny. It's funny to hear these guys sort of, you know, talk, go back and forth on how different they feel about, you know, the way life should be led. And, um, you know, and Henderson's just such, such a crack up that, you know, like when, when Dafu will make these very sort of interesting Zen-like proclamations and then they'll just be this aside that Henderson will make about like, you know, yeah, right. You know, this is really going to happen. It's crazy. <laughs> you know, it's really funny. And I think that what I really love about this book ultimately is that it can attack these kind of very existential weighty things in a way that's, that's humorous. And I, and I think that's another thing that I think is, um, I come out of this book that I think is really important as one goes through life is that you have to also laugh at this stuff as serious as you might take this, you know, this this life thing and so uh, that to me that's really where it sits in my mind i don't know if i I necessarily see dafu as diametrically opposed but i see him as setting up these sort of limits of control over the change you can achieve and i think henderson does change as a result of his experience with the king and his experience in africa and i know it's something that we we talked about it briefly is by the end that sort of freeing that you feel as a reader is the freedom that Henderson sort of discovers within himself that uh, of who he is and what he can achieve and and it comes out in in, in his language and in his response to things i you know i'm one to say that no i don't think he actually changed i think he he uncovered what was there all along and maybe that is a cliche and maybe that's that's kind of in a weird way calling out all of these uh travel novels and literary i'm exploring myself and in an expat location kind of thing and uh uh, you know that's been that's been a style and a tradition for a while um but it there is some truth to that right you have to put yourself uh in scenarios that you can't control to understand where your limits are and i think that's where the big shift in henderson was is you know, really up until the point where he formally became the Rain King, 
Um, nobody, nobody really relied on him. Uh, nobody had any expectations. He was so wealthy that he could do whatever he wanted. And, and what that typically meant is he, uh, whether planned or not, was just in impressive opposition with everything around him. Um, but when he finally uh, got put in a position where he, he had requirements and, and people looked at him in a certain way, and uh, you know, then he realized he could no longer be calling all of his own shots. And of course, that that spirals from there as he gets into escalating levels of, um, you know, shenanigans we'll go with. But I think that's, there is something at the end of the day, uh, to how important it is to put yourself in, uh, settings like that to be able to dig that out of you. So, you know, did Henderson really change? Probably not. I see. I I think he did. I think self-discovery is change. And I think you're right that, it is very Nietzschean, this idea of that you have to go through struggle to really understand who you are in some way, right? Yeah, I guess that's really my two cents of that self-discovery is a form of change because it changes the way you perceive who you are, and that, of course, affects how you perceive the world. Yeah, I think, as David, as I was making that argument in the, in the, in the text last night, I think that, yeah, it's, a, it's an issue of semantics of what we think change is about. I the what I was thinking about when I was thinking about this idea of change is like, hmm, I wonder what like Henderson the epilogue or Henderson at rest, you know, the next Henderson book, if there had ever been one, you know, what really, you know, what would have changed? And, and I think that for me is the interesting and comedic thing as well is that the, even though I felt like he had these epiphanies, especially near the end, I also was like, he's just going to go back and be the same. And he has his lion cub. and But it's like everybody, we go on these big trips. We have these really big experiences that certainly unearth things and change us. But, um, you know, I just think about how those things fade. You know, those things that, those epiphanies that we have are these things that we think about when we do get to travel and put ourselves out of our usual context. We do come back super inspired, and I would say 90% of the stuff that we maybe think we're going to do or we've learned from it, I think, maybe fades away. And, of course, that 10% then becomes really important. But And it is that sort of unearthing of like, yeah, this is what I'm about, and maybe next time I will incrementally do something a little bit differently. But I think, to me, what's really funny about the at the end of the book is that, yeah, there's this there's this change in him, but it's still him. You know, and I think that that's what I think, Nick, you were getting at. And and uh, that, that's to me what makes the book rich is that it kind of says, yeah, you can change. And it also kind of makes fun of, I think it makes fun a little bit of these people that do go to these extreme lengths to kind of figure things out. And and, and really at the end of the day, it's... Um, well, really at the end of the day, all you have to do is watch someone get eaten by a lion. R- right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, and I, I just think about it in today's context, the extent that people do to, to go to enlightenment or have these extreme experiences. And, you know, it's funny how we think, oh, we're in a very self-help kind of age. But I, I read this book and I go, you know, people have been grappling with this for millennia, you know, and uh, and it's just we have different ways of doing it depending on the time period that we live in. And I think this book is a, a good reminder of that in a lot of ways. So we've kind of been talking about this at a general philosophical level. Are there any specific moments that stand out to you guys? I have to say it would be interesting to discuss, um, you know, for me it was the chapter where he wrote the letter to his wife and then the chapter where the the Dafa gets eaten by the lion and then the last chapter where he's on the plane and he tells that crazy story about the bear and the roller coaster. I just feel like, you know, to me, it was really those three chapters that really brought this book home for me. And, um, you know, I was three quarters of the way through this, and I'm like, I don't really know if I like this one very much, or at least as much as the other ones. And then literally, those kind of three chapters, one after the other, three or four, one after the other, it was like, wow, okay, you know, this really made an impression. <laughs> yeah, so I let's let's talk about the bear and the roller coaster thing, because that was... That was fantastic to me. Uh, Sm- Smolak, I believe, was the name of the bear. 
Uh, so what what is Bellow really pulling together with that one? Because I still have some questions on it. I have, I have kind of an idea. But, um, you know, Eric, what do you, what do you think on that? Yeah, I mean, I have to say that's been eating at me since I finished it. Because on the one hand, it was one of the most poignant part of the books. It was, to me, um, and maybe it's really about the fact that is Bella making kind of a both a poignant and a funny sort of um, move here? And then he's saying like the most kind of rich relationship that Henderson has had, short of maybe with the king up to this point, um, with this bear. I mean, it was really crazy. It was this really strange, unadulterated sort of um, brief relationship that, um, for someone who's so far f- through the whole rest of the book was trying to find this enlightenment, trying to connect with the world, and yet sort of constantly self-sabotaging in the way he treated other people and the way he sort of was trying to, you know, connect with the king and, and, and Roma, Romalayu, is that how you say his name? Um, and, uh, and suddenly there's this story at the end that he, where he talks about very fondly about his relationship with this, this bear. I, I have to say it, I, I haven't sorted it out other than it was such a wonderful part of the book. I mean, really, it was, I remember I put a little thing next to the margin that just had this little tear and under an eye. It was like, oh my gosh, you know. Yeah, it's, it's impressively emotional for such yeah. kind of like a, a, an awkward random aside. Of course, it's not awkward and not random in any, in any uh, respect. But here, I'll just, I'll just read some of it. And uh, <laughs> this poor, broken, ruined creature and I alone took the high rides twice a day. And while we climbed and dipped and swooped and swerved and rose again higher than the Ferris wheels and fell, we held on to each other. By a common bond of despair, we embraced cheek to cheek as all support seemed to leave us, and we started down the perpendicular drop. I was pressed into his long-suffering, age-worn, tragic, and discolored coat as he grunted and cried to me. At times, the animal would wet himself. (laughs) And you, you really do see that there was a true bond between Henderson and this animal and yeah I I like the question of is is this the most meaningful bond he's actually he's actually ever had and that's why he's recounting it towards the end of this novel I think the end of that passage really kind of gets to it and I know uh, I'm I'm gonna go ahead and read it as well I'm just gonna keep going because I I think it's at the end is where you kind of see how important the story is at the end of the book for connecting to everything that came before it at the end of describing this this sort of relationship, he says, So if corporeal things are an image of the spiritual, and vis- visible objects are renderings of invisible ones, and if Smolek and I were outcast together, too humorous before the crowd, but brothers in our souls, I am bared by him, and he probably humanized by me. I didn't come to the pigs as a tabula rasa. It only stands to reason. Something deep already was inscribed on me, in the end, I wonder if Dafu would have found this out for himself. I, I think the reason why that scene and that relationship is so important is because, and this kind of goes to what Eric was saying and what we've been saying, this idea of discovery of what's already inside of us. He's already been through this once before. He just didn't realize it. And Dafu never had the chance to realize that he was killed by it. This, this idea of what uh, Henderson later learns is he shouldn't have been asking the I want, but what does he want? What does they want? What do you want? This idea of sort of interconnectivity or understanding the self through a connection with another being, even if that being is an old, sad, worn out carnival animal. Yeah. I mean, the next, David, the next sentence right after that, what you finished is once more, whatever gains I ever made were always due to love and nothing else. And, you know, and I think that's really some of the inherent conflict in, in this novel and other Bella novels and in a lot of the novels of, of I think, the, the, especially the men who wrote in this post-war period, you know, this constant issue between, you know, me, 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 I want, I want, I want, and then understanding that maybe, maybe it, trying to acknowledge that, yeah, actually, though, part of what makes life great is not being so self obsessed and actually, you know, loving something else. And, 
I think it's very interesting that, um, and, and this is, I've talked about this before um, with Nick, is that there's this really interesting dynamic that's happening in this time period, right, where you have this generation coming off this war that for a lot of people, especially people who fought in it, it's this amazing, hor- horrible, you know, experience that, that you that will never leave you right and 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 so you suddenly have this fuller understanding of the world and yet you're also going into this period that's unbelievably conformist and repressed and so these i have to think that those energies you know you know fighting against each other in this period is you know a lot of that energy i think was being sublimated in writing like bellows and and i think that it carries through a lot to the, the heirs of his work, whether it's, you know, Updike or, or Roth or whatever, this constant battle between there's this conformist thing that I'm supposed to do and then this giant existential weight of, like, it's life, man. We could die. I need to, like, live. You know, it's about me. And and I think that um, what I love about these authors is that it really feels like there's something huge at stake here. Like, these guys are really, these characters are always, like, this is a life or death thing, this struggle. And there's rarely any ironic distance in the way they write about it. And I think that's why I go back to a lot of these writers is because I appreciate the fact that they're grappling with this in a way that doesn't have any ironic distance. It's really kind of in your face and really um, unadulterated. You know, it feels very true. And um, I think that's why I go back to a lot of these authors a lot is because I, I, I feel that that struggle is really still relevant and still important. And I want to talk about it in a frank way, not in sort of a clever postmodern one. And I think that issue that you discuss is what Henderson is dealing with. It's this idea of what he calls bursting the spirit sleep. And in a, in a way, that sort of big topic in today's age feels hard to talk about, but at then almost felt like a necessary topic for for society to engage with is is our spirit asleep and how do we wake from it i guess or i'm talking out my ass (laughs) (laughs) Uh, yeah i i I, on on this topic uh, what i love is that so you mentioned you know the updikes and the roths and stuff and and how they're they're so passionately uh, engaged in this struggle and going for it and they're all in and I think one of the things that really appeals to me about Henderson the Rain King is that that struggle is very much a part of it and he actually just references it directly it's it is the topic of the novel but uh, Bello actually goes slightly further um, in sort of wrapping up a lot of this stuff with the Henderson sort of nuggets and and brief bursts of, of philosophical brilliance and uh, I feel like with a lot of Updike and Roth and, and other sort of post-war authors, they were a little cautious in trying to wrap it up too well. And so you're left with this continual weight. And, and really the point of a lot of their books is just that that weight's never going to go away and just deal with it. And that's the reality. And uh, I think Bellow is also in that category. But Henderson is just a little bit different in that he goes a little bit further. And, you know, we were talking about the quote of... Um, of, uh, you know, him wanting things versus, you know, should have been paying attention to the wants around him. And, uh, you know, he even goes to say, and moreover, it's love that makes reality reality. The opposite makes the opposite. And, you know, I just love that Henderson is the one who boisterous and, and erratic and all that stuff is the one that really pulls some of this together in, in a genre of fiction where it was almost like the goal was to admit that it was impossible to truly pull it together. Yeah, that's a. I mean, I think Nick, that's a great point. I think it's why I think Bello um, is a bit more expansive of a writer than the other one. These these ones that came after him, in the sense that what was really great about this book, and it's funny how talking about it makes me appreciate it more, is that you know Bello didn't do the same old like, hey, it's this first person existential you know rant. I'm going to actually sort of try to write a. I mean, it's really it's a fable of sorts. This book, and and it sort of swerves into like you said a much different genre than a lot of these writers that we associate with Bella would be daring would be willing to go and I think that 
in some ways, I think he's saying that like, if it's a fable, I need to give some, I need to give that genre to do a little bit and have an ending that at least if it's not so kind of, you know, in that genre, at least is acknowledging that I've been, you know, bringing you on this journey that has a very fantastical kind of fable like quality to it. And so I'm going to give you a little bit that at the end too. And I think that to me, that that's very daring for, the, a writer in this kind of mini mini sort of group that we've been talking about is that he's willing to sort of okay you know I brought you on this journey and I'm gonna sort of give you a little bit of a I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a little bit of this sort of ending that fits with this genre and, and um, I you know I I really appreciate that about this book it's a really interesting hybrid when you really begin to break it down and. And I'm I'm appreciating the the accomplishment even more now as we talk about it. Yeah, and all how a lot of other guys are really writing about the battle and reinforcing the battle. Um, Bello a lot of times was you know sort of questioning why that has to exist in the first place. And it's actually also you know like this entire book full of uh, amazing quotes is uh, what I'd like to know is why this has to be fought by everybody for there is nothing that struggle against so hard as coming to we grow these sores instead burning sores, fertile sores. And so he's basically calling out the whole thing of, you know, we, we actually put more effort into, into continually growing grumpier and, and more existential and, and, you know, acknowledging the battle too much when maybe we should be focusing on, you know, what's left over instead of focusing on the death and dying of it. Why don't we focus on the life and living of it? And, uh, you know, I just, I really feel like Henderson is, is helping us turning a corner in that while acknowledging the struggle and then just uh, sort of giving us direction uh, out of it. So, so you feel like you gained something from, from that? Yeah, I think I, as a person, always <laughs> need people to ri- remind myself to, you know, get out of the spirals and depths that I, you know, I put myself into probably on a daily basis. And so like reading Henderson, the Rain King, you know, I remember finishing it. I remember where I was. I was I was on a train and like I read the last couple pages and was just like, this is badass. Like this makes me like want to go home and I don't know, like ride my bike or something instead of like pulling out the next existential novel, you know, in my list of things that Eric has been continually funneling my way. Um, <laughs> but like, yeah, it, it does. It does inspire you. And, and, and that's, I think, part of the like the beautiful literalness of this is as it is a spirit search novel, as it is a travel novel, as it is a find yourself novel, it sort of makes fun of that at the same time while being exactly that. And that, that rubs off on me. I I respond well to things like that. And I have to remind myself not to continually be surrounding myself with more evidence of the struggle. Maybe I should just get out of it and, you know, just ignore it for, you know, an hour or two here and there. Well, I mean, I have to say, guys, I, I, the one of the places I laughed out loud was in that last chapter where he, he's on the plane. He goes, other passengers were reading. Personally, I can't see that. How can you sit in a plane and be so indifferent? I mean, I laughed so hard <laughs> on that because it's like, wait a minute. Like, Bellow's a writer. He obviously wants people to read, but at the same time, here's Henderson going, you're on a plane. You're going on a trip or maybe you're going home. Why aren't, why are you reading? Why aren't you like, you know, sitting up and talking to people or whatever. And I, I, that little moment to me was just so exactly an illustration of what you're talking about. It's like, yeah, this stuff is important, but at the same time, you know, to be able to, to experience or even write great things, you can't just be reading books the whole time and sort of, you know, sitting like Nietzsche in a corner and really just getting all intense while the world goes on outside your room, you know, and, uh, and I, I love that in that little moment, he kind of raised the debate. It's like, um, I thought to myself, am I spending too much time reading and not getting out in the world enough? I mean, that one little moment. And I and uh, I, I really appreciated that little aside because um, I'm sure it was intentional. Yeah, exactly. But like, it's the 50s and he's in a he's in a cross-Atlantic flight and just this metal tube that's flying through the air. Like everyone should just be so fucking stoked right now. Like that, like technology is allowing this to happen. And he's looking around and everyone's just reading, you know, what probably novels that we now consider to be <laughs> the classics that we spend all of our time reading now that, you know, Henderson's looking around in real time, making fun of the people for wasting, you know, this beautiful reality that's happening around them. We like to think that those 
back then people were such more uh, better read than they are now. It's it's a nice <laughs> thought. I, th- I think I think he was being a bit judgmental because not everyone had a lion cub in their lap to appreciate it. That <laughs> exactly. But uh, there w- there was another bit of a sort of meta line that he wrote that Henderson says. He says, "I hold a book up to my face, and it takes only one good sentence to turn my brain into a volcano." <laughs> yeah. And I, I love I love that the, the little yeah. asides to the readers, and I think that goes to Henderson's character again is that, you know, he is dichotomous and he is, you know, he could be judgmental, but he is very much full of wanting to live and experience life. And I think that's part of how he wins the readers over. Yeah. What what do you guys think of his relationship uh, with his wife and how, how again in in truly unfiltered manner you know he he uh has this relationship with her that sort of has no no boundaries and you know he's he's writing this letter to her uh that is really kind of a transformative point in the novel and he at the beginning of the of the letter he talks about how you know he's not really drinking that much and then at the end of the letter he talks about he I think he mentions how drunk he is and he can't remember what was in the letter something along those lines and then, like the first chance he gets to uh, to talk with with Lily on, you know, a, a very antiquated, uh, you know, global telephone, and he's he's really struggling with it, uh, with the technology, and there's like the wash of the oceans in between and all that stuff. And then, just towards the end of that conversation, he just is a sentence: "For a big broad, you sound very tiny." And I'd like so he's he's been in Africa for for months. He's completely lost track of time. And like the sixth or seventh sentence he says to his wife is that. And uh, that was one of the things that he loved best about her was her size, because it, it for him it represented that 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 sort of lust for life that she was you know she was full of life. And again, going back to this idea of embodying the soul for Henderson as well, I think he saw something in her that most likely wasn't really there, but he wanted it to be there. Um, in, in, tar- in terms of his relationship with his wife, it, especially early in the book, he's very much the sort of petulant child. You don't, you have a hard time liking as a narrator, but also somewhat appreciate, like when he describes coming in, like sneezing on his hand and shaking hands with his wife's, fake friends <laughs> i kind of enjoyed that part of him as well because he acknowledged that what she was doing was kind of bullshit even though he didn't know how to express that in a reasonable manner you know i think um what's it, it's tough because i think partially it's the point of view of the book partially it's the time of the book the time the book was written in the sense that um, rend- I think the rendering of uh, often the rendering of of female characters with these authors can also can can be sort of not well shaded at best and and borderline misogynist at worst. And so, you know, I I I when I think about their relationship in the book, I. You know, there's. I have to say, it's it's better and more poignant than some of the other kind of relationships in this vein of either Bella or other novels that we think about, and um, in this in this in this realm. But uh, you know, it, it's just it's just hard. I, you know, I think one of the one of the things that that suffers in these kind of novels that are so first person driven, you know grappling with this existential stuff in this time period is that women become the often the butt of a lot of the 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 angst and the and the anger and i think again what was re- a little bit refreshing in this book is that there was a little bit of that but again i think because henderson is so endearing and 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 Bellow very deftly i think also weaves in that he henderson has a lot of love for his wife too and um i think in the context of i think about the other books that i think about in this in this time period in this genre it's actually um even though it's not a huge part of the book it's it's rendered in a way that is much more sympathetic and and refreshing um 
in in the lack of you know just rage and anger that often characterizes um, a lot of um, writing in this in this style in this manner in this time period yeah i think henderson has a bit more of the henry miller-esque than the philip roth sort of (laughs) perception exactly (laughs) um you know it's still got crassness and you know a bit of degradation but there's not the hatred or the the anger at least that i don't see it that way yeah i i kind of viewed it as actually more authentic and more uh more loving than i expected and the reason for that is i I feel like a lot of these authors will um, when they get into that territory is partially because they don't paint the faults of um of the partners and of the person in question they don't they don't paint that correctly and what i mean by that is you know he's very open in sort of his relationship with lily and you know you know how he met her and uh, you know their interactions and uh i think i think she was the one who was engaged like tens of times over and then all something always happened to blow that up and you know he was he was very much in love with everything about her you know down to um how her her character itself sort of embodied lust for life and all of that which ties back into how bellow characters are sort of physically designed to exactly mirror you know both their purpose and you know what is internally inside of them um but i I actually think that he unlike a lot of other authors uh you know bellow created this henderson character to to truly say that you know i i do love everything about you and all of the all the crap that you you do that i don't like but also the crap that you do that i do like and oh at the same time i'm also doing a bunch of crap that's kind of terrible too so while that maybe wasn't like a main focus of the story, I think in the broader context of the potential, you know, not positive interactions with women in, in this category of, of literature and time period and, and stuff like that, that, uh, you know, this one's actually one of the least uh, offensive ones. And such a contrast to the next book, which is Herzog, I believe, which is exactly the opposite. I mean, he's, he's going off in that one. And I, I do believe that that book was based on a real betrayal by a, a, a partner, a wife of his. But still, it's it's. I just remember the rage. I can still. I read. I think I read that book twenty years ago, and I still remember that rage. You know, like it was yesterday, and it's such in stark contrast to the to the jolly, you know, nature of Henderson. It's just. It's really interesting to think about this book in the context of the other ones that I've read, um, it makes it a lot more special to me at the more we talk about it. Yeah. So like Bello has written, um, very various different characters. And I would, I would say that towards the end, uh, Henderson does make a turn for, uh, the positive and for, you know, uh, the direction of life rather than the direction of, of death and complacency and, and all that stuff. And so I, I'm just wondering if if Bello at a higher level is sort of commenting on um, sort of individual nature and some people are capable of achieving that and, and finding some level of, of happiness in in their search for that, whereas some others are just predisposed to never really achieving that. And that's due to like a human nature thing and a personality thing and all that. I think it's a bit of both. I think Henderson... Or what rather Bello through Henderson believes that we have a certain nature within us, but that what Henderson ends up doing is sort of listening to the better angels of his nature. And that is really the extent of change you can make, which is kind of the point we were making earlier with Dafu, is that there are limits to the kind of changes you can make to yourself or limits to the, uh, though you might be aware of certain things in yourself that change can only go so far. I mean, Nick, for me, and and this is maybe because I've never read any biographies of Bella, but I did read that giant book of letters a few years ago that was released. And I think that what's interesting about Bella, and I would argue probably a lot of authors of this period, is that you know they were grappling with this stuff themselves, and they were putting it all into their fiction. And I think that you know, whereas I think some writers are all about sort of, you know, creating these fantastical made up stories. I think 
these guys, especially Bella, were trying to really kind of funnel these struggles that they were literally having into some sort of fictional construct. And, um, you know, I've never really sort of thought about, like, what is Augie? What's he grappling with Augie? What's he grappling with with and sees the day? What's he grappling with in Henderson? But when I begin to sort of back up just in this discussion and think about it, I think that, um, you know, Bello is grappling with these big questions as much as Henderson is. And I think that what I love, again, about these writers is that they're willing to do that in the fictional form. I mean, in some ways, fiction like this to me is self-help. And I appreciate it a lot more because instead of giving me easy answers, it just makes me address the hard questions. And um, that, to me, is the richness of Henderson and the richness of a lot of Bella's books, that he's able to kind of raise these big questions about living and still make them entertaining yarns. I mean, I think that's a real gift. Whereas I just, again, I don't feel like a lot of fiction that I read that maybe is written now feels like it has a lot at stake. I'm not saying I don't like it or it's not interesting or I don't get something from it. But every time I go back to these writers, I'm always like, man, I just start thinking about stuff that goes way beyond the usual fiction or nonfiction that I, that I read that's more contemporary. And, uh, you know, to me, that's really, that, that's really a gift that Bello has given, gave the world in terms of literature. Do you feel like there's something with the time period in which the struggle of authors in the mid-century made it possible to yield these types of works, whereas, you know, later our current struggle, whatever that means and however you define that, um, isn't as isn't as easy of a setup to draw those types of conclusions and to get into things that have that level of authenticity and, and urgency? Um, ab- absolutely. I think that if I think about, you know, my grandfather, my mother's side was a World War II vet and he, you know, I could, I could never get anything out of him about that experience. I mean, this is a guy that stormed the beaches of Normandy, pushed all the way through Germany, liberated concentration camps. It's like, you know, he just basically would say to me, everything that's been said about that has been said. I don't need to talk about this. But, you know, I heard stories from my mom that, you know, my, my grandfather really struggled when he came back emotionally. He just didn't have the tools in which to, I think, deal with it. He was sort of that stoic, silent generation. And then I think skipping ahead to my father, who, you know, was kind of on the other, just, just on the uh, the previous side of the kind of the 60s explosion, the boomer explosion, where I think his younger brother and other people younger than him kind of went through this, but he was sort of stranded on the other side. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm making sort of an assumption here, but just... I think my father's my father was the one who gave me a lot of these books and I think even though he hasn't talked about it with me too explicitly I have to assume that a lot of the stuff that was in these books were these big things that you know my dad and people of his generation were grappling with this sudden freedom that you've been given and oh my god I don't know what to do with it you know and um I'm talking about made the 60s the advent of the 60s and And yeah, I just feel like those things were just feel a lot more, at least from my standpoint, significant than some of the the stuff that we've gone through. I mean, maybe maybe you could argue that maybe Delilah was talking a lot about this sort of living in this scary Cold War nuclear age where we could all sort of be obliterated in a second. But, you know, Delilah was always much more diffuse about that kind of stuff. And um, and maybe that's just a that's just a you know, product of the times, but yeah, I just, I I think that to make a long, to make a short answer long, yes, I think that the issues maybe were a lot bigger and that we didn't really have the tools to work with them as much as we do now. I think we're maybe a lot more self-aware and and okay with talking about these things much more frankly, rather than trying to filter them through fiction. I I think like the biggest distinction between then and now, and this is a sort of distinction between modernism, postmodernism, is this idea of these writers and Bello and Henderson specifically are looking, what is the self in relation to the world? And, and postmodernism is kind of saying you don't really have a self outside of what the world is giving you. This idea of, of, of selfhood or agency is more important in these more classic works, and I think it's easier for a lot of people to read them because because we still have this idea that we are unique individual selves trying to figure out where we fit in in the world. And 
we answer these existential questions where a lot of postmodern writers say, no, it's the culture that shapes the self and you don't really exist or you don't, even though you think you do, kind of idea. Or at least that, that that's my sort of perception of the differences in terms of looking at those big existential questions in, in that kind of writing as opposed to more contemporary works. That, yeah, I think it's a great observation. Yeah, I very much feel that. And, you know, the DeLillo references and stuff and, you know, pretty much any of those guys trying to make sense of all of all of the downward forces on you, but it, it's less of an individual thing. It's more of, yeah, where is that piece? Uh, whereas, you know, I love the mid-century stuff where it really is about the individual. And I, I also think part of it just has to do with like how much, how many voices, how much information, how many different ways could you hear it uh, in then versus now? I think the reality of you look at 50s, early 60s, you know, there were really only a few channels in which that could happen. And, you know, through fiction was one of them. And now we're, we're simply just inundated with, you know, so much oversaturation in, in data and music and entertainment. And I think that has really shaped a lot of fiction. And, you know, it's, it's everybody's challenge. Like, how do you deal with that? And, you know, conversations and, and access to stuff are so much easier. If you have a problem, you just, you just find the information. Uh, whereas if you, if you have a problem in the middle, middle part of the century, you know, maybe you have to literally wait until Saul Bellow uh, summarizes that for you in, a, of course, an amazingly eloquent way. But to to let you know that maybe you're not alone, that these struggles are they're real and everybody has them. And even though nobody's talking about them, that they're that they're present. I, I also think I want to acknowledge, too, that, yeah, it was about the individual in these novels, but I think more often than not, it was the sort of white male perspective. And I think another thing that's happened in contemporary times is that you've, you have this multiplicity of voices. And I think maybe with that multiplicity of voices comes this kind of long tail thing where there's just a lot of, you know, there's a lot of different things to choose from. And there isn't kind of this critical mass around you know, big ideas that maybe happened in the post-war period or happened in the 60s. I mean, now you have these, you know, you have all these splinters in terms of, you know, issues and points of view. And I think it's a great thing, but I think the, the, the one sort of byproduct of that is that you don't have these kind of, you know, heroic is not quite the right word, but these books, these mid-century sort of books do feel heroic in this very sort of, like I said, something's at stake way. And, but, you know, for, I'm sure there are plenty of people, whether they're women or people who weren't, you know, of this time and of this privilege who read this stuff and is like, what a load of crap. You know, I don't relate to this at all. And, um, and, you know, I, I think it's interesting because I think that, that's maybe partially the reason Bello in recent years has at least not, I don't think, been as read as much as he had been in the past is because he does represent this kind of old white man sort of perspective that I think, for better or for worse, is not really in vogue right now. And so I think we really relate to it because I think we're tied to that experience much more directly. But, you know, if my I'd be curious to know what would happen if, you know, my wife read this book, would she feel the same way? And and, and that's, to me, the test. And I guess that enough people are still reading them that I got to think that it has super, um, you know, transcended that, that those, those kind of trappings of its time. Yeah, that's very true. With, with all of the extra voices and, and all of, all of those messages, it, it, uh, you know, weakens is, is not correct, but op opens up so many more viewpoints that, um, it's, it's as hard to feel authentic in creating something of this exact, uh, style and viewpoint today, partially like you mentioned, because maybe it, it isn't as in vogue presently, but also because it's, it's hard to, it's hard to be so far in, um, to not be acknowledging so many of those other external forces and partially because that means if you if you wrote a book like this today, maybe you would just sort of be characterized as an asshole. So. <laughs> Thank you for listening, everyone. For updates on the next book selection, check out booksofsomesubstance.com and follow us on Twitter at booksofsubstance. You too will die of this pestilence. 
death will annihilate you and nothing will remain, and there will be nothing left but junk, because nothing will have been and so nothing will be left, while something still is, now, for the sake of all, get out.